Well, welcome to this video lecture on a unique use of the classical orders, one that still can effectively serve its original purpose. With this video, we will explore Thomas Jefferson's application of different versions of the classical orders in his design for the University of Virginia. Jefferson stated explicitly that his choice of orders was meant to serve as specimens for the architectural lectures. I'm Calder Loth, an architectural historian and a graduate of the University of Virginia's School of Architecture. I also serve on the university's Historic Preservation Advisory Committee. One of Jefferson's primary ambitions in his long life was to found a university, one not affiliated with any religious denomination, but one based on what Jefferson declared to be the inimitable freedom of the human mind. Architecture, of course, was one of Jefferson's passions, a passion he exercised in designing the university, which he called the hobby of his old age. In doing so, he broke with the tradition of combining all of the facilities into one large building, which was the standard college design then. Instead, he conceived the idea of creating what he called an academical village where the institution's various components, dormitories, faculty quarters, lecture rooms, library, and dining facilities could be accommodated in separate but connecting structures, offering maximum opportunity for architectural expression. We see this novel plan. Its central area is dominated by two long ranges spread on either side of a grassy common termed the lawn. In each range are five pavilions, each containing a lecture room and study on the first floor, and quarters for a faculty member and family on the second floor, with kitchen and dining room in the basement. The student rooms occupy the spaces between the pavilions. Now, outside the lawns ranges are two additional ranges of student rooms. These are fronted by arcades rather than colonnades. At each end and in the middle of these ranges, he placed a hotel or dining hall, each containing quarters for the hotel keeper and family. Between the inner and outer ranges, Jefferson planned gardens enclosed by serpentine brick walls. Now, the round building at the head of the lawn housed the library, a building named the Rotunda, which we will discuss later. The 1826 Tanner engraving reveals the lawn essentially is built. Note that each pavilion is different, each displaying a different version of a classical order. As Jefferson wrote to William Thornton in 1817, the pavilions will be, quote, models of taste and good architecture and of a variety of appearance, no two alike, so to serve as specimens for the architectural lectures. In other words, Jefferson's scheme was a unique attempt to provide physical examples of classical architecture for didactic purposes. He was determined that the university students receive a measure of architectural literacy, and miraculously, the design was achieved with every detail considered by Jefferson, as we shall see. So the object of this video lecture is to demonstrate that Jefferson's academical village can yet be a vehicle for teaching the classical language to a broad audience through the magic of the Internet. To begin this course, we first need to look at the published sources for the orders that Jefferson employed in his design. Jefferson had the most extensive private architectural library in the country. We see one of his folios spread on his drafting table in Monticello. For the majority of his design, Jefferson relied primarily on two works. First, Andrea Palladio's famous 1570 treatise, The Four Books on Architecture. Jefferson owned an early edition of the four books showing Palladio's original woodcut illustrations. But he also owned Giacomo Leone's 1715 English language edition of Palladio's The Four Books, as well as a 1721 edition. In his edition, Leone redrew all of Palladio's plates to make copper plate engravings. Now note the difference between a woodcut and an engraving in the two images of the Pantheon. 
No doubt Jefferson was captivated by Leone's beautiful crisp plates and relied on them as reference for what he considered to be the modern orders. By modern, it meant that Palladio's standardized interpretations of the orders were based on his study of the ruins. These were illustrated in Book I of his four-part treatise. Jefferson's second reference was a French one, Roland Fréard de Chambray's A Parallel of Architecture, both ancient and modern, originally published in 1650. For convenience, I will be using and quoting from John Evelyn's English edition of Fréard's work, published in 1664, and will refer to the author simply as Fréard and his book as Freyar's Parallel. Now, an architectural parallel is a compendium of images showing different variations and interpretations of the orders. Freyar's Parallel has many plates contrasting ancient with modern versions of the orders. For instance, we see on the left Freyar's depiction of the Ionic order from a specific ancient ruin, Rome's Theater of Marcellus. Freyar compares it, among others, with two modern Ionic versions, shown on the right, one from Palladio's treatise and one from Vincenzo Scamozzi's. A third work that comes slightly into play here is Antoine Degaudet's lavishly illustrated treatise on Roman ruins. Degaudet was commissioned by Jean-Baptiste Colbert, chief minister to Louis XIV, to visit Rome and make measurements of the ruins for a publication to be used by French architects. This work, the ancient buildings of Rome, drawn and measured very exactly, now that's my translation, is yet one of the most reliably accurate recordings of Rome's ancient monuments. For example, we can compare Palladio's depiction of the Corinthian order of Rome's Temple of Vesta with Degade's. Palladio shows what essentially is just a generic Corinthian capital. Beside it is Degade's very precise and very accurate delineation of the temple's Corinthian capital. And a look at the temple's actual capitals reveals Degade's accuracy. So keeping these sources in mind, we can now begin our detailed examination of Jefferson's specimens for the architectural lectures, beginning with the ten pavilions. Jefferson numbered the pavilions in a sort of shoelace pattern, starting with Pavilion 1 on the upper left, then straight across to Pavilion 2, then diagonally back across is Pavilion 3, and straight across from 3 is Pavilion 4, then diagonally down is Pavilion 5, and so on, finally ending at Pavilion 10 in the lower right. Let's go to Pavilion 1 in the upper west side. Jefferson's elevation drawing shows a temple front with widely spaced columns, a forthright composition. Now, as for the columns positioning, Jefferson employed area style spacing. On the right is a diagram of this spacing option outlined in red. The space between each column measures four column diameters or modules. In his ancient treatise, Vitruvius stated that structurally, area style cannot support stone for the entablature, the span is too great, but must have wooden beams laid upon the columns. Pavilion 1 complies with Vitruvius's forewarning since its entablature is wooden construction. On the top line of Pavilion 1's specifications, Jefferson wrote, Doric of Diocletian's Baths, Chambray. That means the order is to be the Doric of the Baths of Diocletian, as illustrated in Freyar's Parallel. And here is Freyar's depiction of that striking order. Now, where in the vast complex of the Baths of Diocletian did Freyar find this order? Well, you won't find the order intact. Rather, Freyar constructed his depiction of the order based on fragments found among the Bez's innumerable artifacts. One of the artifacts was this fragment of an entablature frieze with its metopes decorated with a mask, probably Apollo, with emanating rays. 
This fragment was illustrated in a work on Roman baths by British architect Charles Cameron, published in 1775. As noted in its title, the book is based on Palladio's study and illustrations of Roman baths. Palladio intended to publish this material himself, but died before he could accomplish it. Cameron resurrected the project 200 years later and added some of his own illustrations and commentary. On the left is Cameron's title page, and on the right is his illustration of additional fragments of this Doric order, a capital and cornice fragment. Freyar combined these with the frieze fragment to compose his depiction of the Doric of the Baths of Diocletian. And it was Freyar's illustration that Jefferson used in his design for Pavilion 1. We see how faithfully he adapted it for Pavilion 1's entablature, though with some simplification, but keeping the dentils with their notches in each. A distinguishing feature of the order's capitals is the use of a sima recta profile, or S-curve, for the echinus, rather than the standard ovolo or quarter round. This detail was not overlooked by Jefferson, and even though he eliminated the ornamentation shown in Freyar's capital, the order's essential character is maintained. Now, the sima recta echinus is not unique to the Diocletian Doric, but it's rare. It's sometimes seen on Renaissance works and even some American classical works, so look for it. In summary, with Pavilion 1, Jefferson gave us a bold application of a singular ancient version of the Doric order, one seldom seen. Okay, opposite Pavilion 1 is Pavilion 2, a visually satisfying word. Like Pavilion 1, it employs an ancient version of a Roman order rather than a Renaissance or modern one. Jefferson noted the source of the order in his elevation drawing of Pavilion 2, Ionic of Fortuna Verilis. Before discussing this order, I should note a catchy detail that Jefferson appended to most of his pavilion designs, and that is giving the chimney stack the profile of a classical pedestal. Well, the name Fortuna Verilis referenced the ancient temple of Fortuna Verilis, or manly fortune, which survives intact in Rome. The view by Piranesi shows how Palladio probably found the temple. It had long been converted to a church and stood attached to later buildings, with its portico walled up. Below is the temple today, standing unencumbered, the result of a 1930s restoration which revealed a diminutive but elegant work. Now, even dealing with its much altered earlier form, Palladio was able to produce credible restoration images for Book 4 of his treatise. Book 4 is the section where Palladio illustrated his restoration drawings of ancient temples. We see elevations and details as depicted in the Leone edition, Jefferson's reference for this ancient order. Now, I need to note here that scholars have since determined that the temple was not originally dedicated to Fortuna Verilis, but rather to Portunus, the god of ports. The temple is near a section of the Tiber River that served as a port for Rome. Well, Pavilion 2's column arrangement employs die-style spacing, or bays that have the width of three column diameters, a fairly standard portico treatment. Now, a conspicuous feature of the order is its richly ornamented frieze. We have swags of fruit and vegetables alternating with bucrani or ox skulls, symbols of sacrifice, and puti or infants, ancient symbols of attendance to the gods. The frieze ornaments here are made of lead, ordered by Jefferson from William Coffey, a Philadelphia architectural ornament maker. Compared with Palladio's illustration, coffee swags are considerably leaner. And adding confusion to the subject, we see that Degade has depicted the temple's frieze with swags of oak leaves rather than fruits and vegetables and has included Roman candlesticks, which Palladio does not. 
Now, if we look at the one very worn section of the ancient temple's surviving frieze ornaments, we see that there is indeed a Roman candlestick and thin swags of oak leaves. Interestingly, as noted, Jefferson owned Degaday's treatise, and he elected to use Degaday's more accurate depiction of the frieze for his Monticello bedroom. But for Pavilion 2, Jefferson incorporated Palladio's less authentic version of the frieze. This is one of the several anomalies in Jefferson's university design. We can rationalize that since Jefferson was a devoted disciple of Palladio, he had no qualms about following his illustrations, accurate or not. Or it may be because Jefferson had sold his copy of Degaday's book to the Library of Congress prior to designing the university. Well, Pavilion II's marble ionic capitals are among those ordered by Jefferson from stone workers in Carrara, Italy. Attempts were made to carve the ionic and Corinthian capitals on site using local stone, but the stone proved unsuitable for fine details. And we'll talk more about this subject shortly. And like the ancient temple of Fortuna Viralis or Portunus, Pavilion II's corner capitals are what's termed two-sided capitals, or just corner capitals. That means the corner volute projects at a 45-degree angle rather than having parallel pairs of volutes front and back. We see this in Palladio's plan of the capital. This enables the corner capital to relate both to a building's front and side. The two-sided capital was developed by the Greeks and is most famously displayed in the portico of the Erechtheum, the Ionic temple next to the Parthenon on the Acropolis. Finally, except for the wider spacing of its columns, Pavilion II does bear a resemblance to its ancient inspiration, and it's the only one of the university's pavilions where volume, scale, and detailing combine to recall the general appearance of an actual ancient structure. All the other pavilions exhibit only the order, either ancient or modern. Well, before we jump to Pavilion 3, I think this is a good place to say a word about a dominant element in Jefferson's scheme. I'm speaking of the Chinese lattice railings atop the colonnades fronting the student rooms. They visually bind each range of the composition and provide an upper-level walkway the full length of each range. Now, Chinese lattice gained some popularity in the colonial period for stair railings, as seen in Battersea, a house familiar to Jefferson. And Jefferson rarely missed an opportunity to apply Chinese railings to any of his works, including the roof of Monticello. Jefferson is likely to have gotten the idea from an illustration in Sir William Chambers' book on Chinese-style architecture, a work on Jefferson's list of books he wanted for the university's library. Why Jefferson chose to add such an exotic feature to an otherwise purely classical scheme can only be explained that he really liked Chinese lattice. The point is, if you're your own client, you can do whatever you want. Well, having noted the railings, we can now cross the lawn to Pavilion 3. On this sheet of Jefferson's elevation and floor plans, we see in the upper left corner that Jefferson has written Corinthian Palladio, in other words, a modern order. His elevation drawing shows the facade appearing to be largely glass, helped by the use of triple-hung sash windows the photograph shows that the windows extend to floor level and that Chinese lattice panels are placed over the bottom sashes for security, an original feature. Like Pavilion 2, Jefferson hoped to have the capitals carved from local stone. To that end, he had two stone workers, the brothers Giacomo and Michele Raggi, brought to Charlottesville from Italy to execute the Ionic and Corinthian capitals for the pavilions and the rotunda. Well, despite their valiant attempts, the Raggy brothers determined the local stone unsuitable for the execution of fine details. And one of their failed attempts at a Corinthian capital survives as a much-worn ornament in the garden of Pavilion 1. 
Well, disappointed, Jefferson resolved to have the capitals produced in Italy using time-tested Carrara marble. He thus sent his agent in Italy detailed instructions on which version of the Corinthian to use for Pavilion III's capitals. He wrote, quote, to be copied exactly from the Corinthian capital of Palladio, as given in his first book, its 17th chapter, in which he describes the Corinthian capital, particularly the drawing of which is in plate 26 in Leone's edition, unquote. Now, I don't know if we can assume that Carrara artisans had a copy of the Leone edition. Nevertheless, this is plate 26. And here is one of the resulting Carrara capitals. It has slight differences from plate 26, but the capitals leave little room for complaint and survive in near perfect condition after some 200 years. Now, as for Pavilion 3's column spacing, the portico employs the tighter cis-style spacing, meaning the distance between columns is only two column diameters. Now, in perusing Palladio's treatise, this illustration of the Temple of Pola may have influenced Jefferson's design for the Pavilion 3 portico. The temple, like Pavilion 3, has a tetrastyle or four-column Corinthian portico with tight column spacing and smooth shafts. Looking at this photo of Pavilion 3's facade, you may have noticed something missing. We see the missing feature in Jefferson's drawing, the roof balustrade. The photograph shows the missing element reinstated, and this is part of the university's long-term effort to restore the fronts of the pavilions as nearly as possible to Jefferson's design. The original balustrade disappeared sometime in the late 19th century. Its return is a welcome addition. Well, facing Pavilion 3 is Pavilion 4. This work has a strong Doric portico. Jefferson marked on his elevation drawing that its order is the Doric of Albano, in other words, an ancient version of the Doric order. Like Pavilion 1, the published source for the Albano Doric is Freyar's Parallel. Freyar's illustration shows the column with an unfluted shaft and no base. In his accompanying text, Freyar writes, This incomparable Doric masterpiece was discovered at Albano, joining the Church of St. Mary, amongst diverse other odd fragments of architecture, very curious, and of which I have a good number designed and with great diligence examined as to their measures. In other words, like the Doric of the Baths of Diocletian, Freyar didn't find the order intact, but instead composed it from his careful study of the fragments. And the church referenced by Freyar is Albano's Santa Maria della Rotunda, located in the Alban Hills, south of Rome. The church is an early medieval structure incorporating portions of an ancient nymphaeum that was part of a Roman villa established by the emperor Domitian. Nevertheless, I have not been able to determine whether the fragments described by Freyar yet survive either in or near the church. Even so, with the benefit of Freyar's illustration, we have this ancient order gracing the facade of Pavilion 4, but with modifications on Jefferson's part. First, Jefferson has attached bases to the columns. Palladio provides authority to do this. Writing about the Doric order in general, Palladio states in Book 1, quote, This order, meaning Doric, does not have its own base, so that in many buildings columns can be seen without bases, but sometimes the attic base is used with it, which greatly increases its beauty, unquote. So here we have added column bases on Pavilion 4's Albano Doric. And as for the term attic base, attic is the term for Attica, the area around Athens, which is where this particular column base is said to have originated. Examples of attic bases are shown in both Palladio's and James Gibbs's treatises, 
Both of these books were owned by Jefferson. The attic base consists of two toruses, or half-round moldings, separated by a scotia, a deep, concave molding. Jefferson could have referenced either of these depictions of the bases for Pavilion 4. While the Doric of Albano is also noteworthy for the very deep mutils in its cornice, these are studded with 36 guta, that is, pegs, symbolically representing ancient primitive wooden construction. Here again, Jefferson makes a modification. He eliminates eight guta and replaces them with a flat tab. To find out what's behind this, we return to James Gibbs's treatise. The title page of the 1738 edition owned by Jefferson is seen here. For his Doric order, Gibbs removed eight guta and filled the void with a flat tab. This treatment of the mutils is unique to Gibbs, who offers no explanation for it. Perhaps he thought the original Albano was just too fussy. Well, Jefferson apparently preferred this modification. He used this Gibbs version in his Monticello Tea Room, and in the Parlor Entablature of Pavilion 2, and the Parlor Entablature of Pavilion 10, as well as the Portico of Pavilion 4. So again, Jefferson is putting his own spin on an order, demonstrating that such informed, subtle adjustments are permissible and can be effective. Across the lawn from Pavilion 4 is Pavilion 5. Jefferson's elevation shows it fronted by a two-story hexastyle or six-column ionic colonnade rather than a pedimented portico. Above the colonnade is a parapet masking a flat roof and the inevitable pedestal chimney stack. Now, in this more precise depiction, a watercolor rendering by John Nielsen, Jefferson's principal university builder and an able draftsman, we see that Nielsen has correctly placed the chimney stack behind the parapet, and he shows the parapet as being paneled. Pavilion 5's flat roof, like all of Jefferson's flat roofs, leaked badly from the beginning, and in the 1830s it was covered over with a pyramidal roof requiring removal of the parapet. Well, because of the photograph angle here, the pyramidal roof is barely showing. Jefferson's specifications noted that Pavilion 5's order was to be, quote, Palladio's Ionic Medillion Order, that is, a modern order. We see this order depicted in the Leone edition. The order's capital is shown here beside another trial capital of local stone. And this particular version of the Ionic has foliated ornaments trailing from the center of the capital into the volutes. Well, this attempt with local stone wasn't acceptable either. So like Pavilion 2 and 3, Pavilion 5's capitals were included in the order for marble capitals from Carrara. Jefferson's order sent to Italy specified that the Pavilion 5 capitals were to be, quote, copied from the capitals of Palladio, as given in his first book, in which he describes the Ionic capital particularly, the drawings of which are in plates 20 and 22, page 28 of the Leone edition of Palladio. So, here we are seeing plates 20 and 22. Plate 20 eliminates the foliated decorations. Plate 22 has the medallion cornice which Jefferson referenced in his specification. So which of these plates are the Carrara workers supposed to use for the capitals? Well, it could have been a coin toss. Anyway, the capitals that Jefferson did receive from Italy were the simpler version, as shown in plate 20 devoid of the foliated ornaments. Nevertheless, the university's joiner succeeded in providing Jefferson his ionic modillion cornice for the entablature based on plate 22, albeit somewhat simplified. As for the column spacing, Pavilion 5 displays one of Jefferson's rare uses of U-style spacing. In his ancient treatise, Vitruvius declared U-style to be, quote, the most approved with a view to convenience, beauty, and strength." Quote. Standard U-style spacing has bays 
two and a quarter column diameters wide, except for the middle bay, which is three column diameters wide. The wider center bay gives emphasis to a building's entrance and adds a subtle rhythm to the portico. Well, all in all, the design is a happy outcome. Pavilion 5 is a dignified and compatible addition to the academical village. Well, facing Pavilion 5 across the lawn is Pavilion 6. As shown in Jefferson's elevation, the design has no portico, and Jefferson provides no reason for this decision. His notes merely state that the order is the Ionic of the theater of Marcellus, and that the pavilion is to have no columns. But the pavilion did require the Tuscan colonnade skirting the first floor, continuing the sheltered passageway. Nevertheless, the absence of a portico does not prevent Pavilion 6 from being a potent architectural statement. So what about this alluding to the theater of Marcellus? To answer, we need to visit the theater, a powerful ruin in the heart of Rome. Now, Jefferson didn't state his published source for the order, either in his notes or on his drawing. But he could and did access the theater's Ionic order from his copy of Freyar's Parallel. Freyar gives us a cleaned-up picture of the pretty beat-up engaged Ionic order defining the theater's upper tier. While Jefferson decided against giving the pavilion a portico with columns, he employed the order for the pavilion's mighty pediment, a defining feature of the design. And the side-by-side -side images show how the pavilion's entablature follows this feature of the Marcellus Ionic. The result is a virile composition, one adding variety to Jefferson's complex. Now we now cross over to Pavilion 7. This is where the university began. Its cornerstone was laid here in 1817. The ceremony was held with Masonic ritual, and among those present were Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. James Monroe, the then President of the United States, set the cornerstone. In seeking design ideas for the pavilions, Jefferson wrote William Thornton, the original architect of the U.S. Capitol, asking for a few sketches based on the layout Jefferson had in mind for the pavilions. Thornton's reply included a drawing showing his ideas for a Doric and a Corinthian scheme, each having a portico supported on an arcade. Now, Jefferson had no intention of incorporating arcades on all the pavilions. In his reply to Thornton, Jefferson stated his objective for the pavilion's designs. They were to have, quote, a variety of appearance, no two alike. But Thornton's drawing likely influenced the design just for Pavilion 7. And having an arcade supporting a portico was not a novel idea. James Gibbs used this scheme for one of his country house designs published in his Book of Architecture, a work owned by Jefferson. And Jefferson also used this scheme for the garden front of Poplar Forest, his Bedford County retreat. For Pavilion 7's order, Jefferson wrote on his elevation drawing, Doric Palladio. This, of course, meant the Doric order is shown in Book 1 of the Leone edition of Palladio's treatise, a modern order. As with the other pavilion designs, Jefferson eliminated a number of the ornaments, such as the ox skulls and the metopes and the medallions in the capital's neck but he maintained the order's essentials, such as the soffit details. And on the whole, Pavilion 7's design comfortably integrates itself into the overall scheme. Well, we now come to Pavilion 8 on the east side of the lawn, one of the more complex pavilion designs. Following his correspondence with William Thornton, Jefferson also wrote to architect Benjamin Henry Latrobe, requesting his ideas for the pavilions. Ever eager to assist, Latrobe sent Jefferson a sheet of drawings showing several schemes for pavilions. Well, regrettably, this important document has been lost. 
But Jefferson replied to Latrobe that he would use his ideas for two pavilions, one Corinthian and one Ionic. Well, pavilion 8 likely reflects some of Latrobe's ideas, as it has a complexity quite apart from Jefferson's more straightforward style. Moreover, in his Pavilion 8 specifications, Jefferson wrote Latrobe Front Lodge, suggesting Latrobe's influence on this design. For Pavilion 8's order, Jefferson noted Corinthian Diocletian's bez on his elevation drawing. The drawing also shows a flat roof fronted by a parapet, and as with Pavilion 5, the roof leaked from the beginning, and in a few years was covered over with a low hip roof. Well, this compromised an important design feature, but we have a reliable idea of its original appearance through the magic of computer rendering. The requirement of having a Tuscan colonnade extending across the facade also compromised the design, but it couldn't be helped. The colonnades were a functional necessity for sheltered communication. So with Jefferson telling us he's using the Corinthian of the Baths of Diocletian, we need once again to access Freyar's parallel to see what gives. Well, Freyar's depiction of the Diocletian Corinthian is pretty astonishing. Do we actually think we would see anything like this on Pavilion 8? Well, before we find out, let's look at the background of this order. As with Pavilion 1, the order was not found intact anywhere in the vast jumble of the Bez of Diocletian, only a few fragments. We are again grateful to Charles Cameron for illustrating these bits. And through his study of these fragments, Freyar, as with the Diocletian Doric, was able to recreate this ancient Corinthian order for the illustration in his parallel. And as with his other Ionic and Corinthian capitals, Jefferson ordered marble capitals for Pavilion 8 from Carrara. Well, what was delivered from Italy followed Jefferson's instructions for what amounted to an extreme makeover. And Jefferson had written to Carrara, quote, I should prefer to have only the ovolo of the abacus carved and its cavetto plain, as may be seen in Scamazzi, Chambray's edition. And here we see Scamazzi's Corinthian, published by Freyar. Thus the Carrara capital's ovolo, or top molding, is carved with an egg and dart molding, and the cavetto below it is devoid of ornament, kept plain, as Jefferson requested. Then Jefferson wrote that the Diocletian volutes should be changed to resemble those of Palladio and Scamazzi. And here they're shown side by side in Freyar's parallel. So comparing the final result with the original inspiration, we wonder why Jefferson didn't choose Palladio or Scamazzi for his source in the first place. The Carrara capitals he received barely resemble Freyar's lush depiction of the Corinthian of the Baths of Diocletian. Well, could it be that Jefferson was determined to have an ancient order for Pavilion 8, even though it was so simplified that it looked little like its original source? On the other hand, Pavilion 8's entablature does have the general elements and proportions of the Diocletian Corinthian, even though it's stripped of its ornaments, save for the medallions and the egg and dart and dental moldings. Well, before we leave Pavilion 8, we might note that Antoine Degade played a role with the pavilion's interior. The entablature frieze in the pavilion's second floor parlor displays the instruments of sacrifice as illustrated in Degade's treatise on the ancient ruins of Rome. Degade identifies these as being from the temple of Jupiter Tanit, or Jupiter the Thunderer. Now, scholars now label the ruin as the temple of Vespasian and Titus. And a small section of the temple's frieze survives in the Roman Forum. And only three columns of the temple survive, and they were nearly buried when Degade saw them as shown in Piranesi's engraving. 
and I'm pleased to say that Pavilion 8's current restoration involves removing two centuries of paint layers from the parlor entablature. Well, anchoring the southern end of the lawn's west side is Pavilion 9. It's a delicate and highly individualized composition, one decidedly different from the others. Despite the loss of Latrobe's drawings, I think we can definitely assume Latrobe influenced Pavilion 9's design, especially since Jefferson wrote Latrobe in the upper right corner of his drawings. The pavilion's salient feature is the large exedra or niche dominating the facade. Within the exedra, Jefferson indicated a pair of columns to support an entablature set across the face of the exedra. It would seem probable that such an uncharacteristic treatment of a classical elevation would be a Latrobe proposal. Yet Jefferson would have seen a similar treatment on a prominent Paris mansion while serving as our ambassador to France. This was the mansion of Mademoiselle Guimard, designed by Claude Nicolas Ledoux. Furthermore, this illustration is from a book by Johann Karl Kraft, a work in Jefferson's library. Even so, it would not be out of the question for an informed architect as Latrobe to propose such a scheme. An exceed fronted by a pair of columns is not a renaissance or a modern invention. It was something used in ancient times. We have an example in the ancient temple of Jupiter in Baalbek. And we should not be surprised that Jefferson owned a copy of Robert Wood's lavishly illustrated The Ruins of Baalbek, published in 1757, where this form is shown. Jefferson's specifications call for columns and pilasters for Pavilion 9's exedra to be Tuscan. However, there must have been a change order, since installed instead was a pair of Ionic columns with adjacent pilasters, making a very effective composition. The column capitals used here employ angled volutes. And this version of the Ionic order was promoted by Vincenzo Scamozzi, who followed Palladio as a leading Italian architect. Scamozzi illustrated the angled volute Ionic in his famous treatise, The Idea of a Universal Architecture, showing only this version of the Ionic. Jefferson would have been familiar with Scamozzi's Ionic since he owned a French edition of Scamozzi's discussion of the orders, and it's also shown in Freyar's parallel. Pavilion 9's capitals were crafted by Philip Sturdivant, a Richmond artist who also provided the composite capitals for the rotunda, which we will discuss shortly. Nevertheless, Pavilion 9's capitals have only a superficial resemblance to Scamozzi's version. Apparently, Sturdivant's reference for the order was Asher Benjamin's 1806 American Builder's Companion, a popular pattern book for American builders and craftsmen. We see Benjamin's illustration of the angled volute ionic next to the title page. And comparing Benjamin's illustration with Pavilion 9's capitals, it's evident that they are too close to be coincidental. Whether this change was Jefferson's idea, we don't know, but the capitals did add another version of a classical order to his academical village. And as for the classical order of the pavilion itself, Jefferson wrote on the top line of his notes, 9. Ionic of the Temple of Fortuna Virilis. This doesn't mean columns. Farther down, he explains that the proportions of the pavilion were to follow the proportions of the temple's Ionic order, displaying only the order's entablature. And as for the entablature, Jefferson wrote, quote, adapting the Ionic with dentals from the temple of Fortuna Virilis of Palladio. Well, the pavilion's resulting entablature is a lean adaptation of the Fortuna Virilis entablature, absent of all ornaments, save for the dentals, but in keeping with the pavilion's diminutive scale. Well, all in all, Pavilion 9's singular design has intrigued enthusiasts of Jeffersonian architecture ever since. 
While anchoring the southern end of the lawn's east side is Pavilion 10, a macho work staring down the delicate Pavilion 9 opposite. Like Pavilion 4, Pavilion takes its order from the Theater of Marcellus, but from the theater's lower tier. Jefferson wrote in the Pavilion specifications, quote, Pavilion 10 East, Doric of the Theater of Marcellus, the columns to have no bases, unquote. Most of us are led to believe that only Greek Doric columns have no base. But with Roman Doric, some versions have bases, some don't. Nevertheless, not a few architectural historians have declared Pavilion 10 to be Jefferson's attempt at a Greek order, which decidedly it's not. The Theater of Marcellus is a work of Imperial Rome, named in honor of Caesar Augustus's nephew and son-in-law, Marcus Claudius Marcellus. It's a massive structure in the heart of the city and could hold up to 20,000 spectators. And in this close-up view, we see that its engaged Doric columns indeed have no bases. Well, from these much battered columns, Freyart was able to define and illustrate the theater's baseless Doric that Jefferson applied to Pavilion 10. And we can see, too, that Pavilion 10's capitals and entablature faithfully replicate the Marcellus Doric. Jefferson's elevation for Pavilion 10 shows the portico supported on paired columns. Even so, his drawing shows a facade of only three bays, rather than with five bays as it was actually built, as seen in the modern documentation drawing on the right. While Freyar's parallel is the source for Pavilion 10's order, Jefferson used another published source for a conspicuous feature applied to the pavilion's roof. This is a massive attic. Jefferson based his design on the attic of a flanking wing of what Palladio called the Temple of Nerva Trajan, now more correctly known as the Temple of Minerva. We see Palladio's Book IV depiction on the left. On the right is the surviving section of the attic. Though little more than a fragment, it preserves the essentials of the attic's design. The original appearance of Pavilion 10's attic was documented in both the Tanner engraving and John Nielsen's watercolor rendering, as well as Jefferson's elevation. But as with other such exposed architectural features, Pavilion 10's attic succumbed to damage by the elements and was removed in the mid-19th century. After standing atticless for more than a century, Pavilion 10's attic has recently been replicated part of the university's restoration program. It's hard to miss. Okay, having surveyed and analyzed each of the pavilion's orders, ancient and modern, we now need to turn to the most prevalent of the academical village's orders, the Tuscan. Tuscan colonnades front the student rooms as well as three pavilions, employing a total of nearly 150 columns. The ancient writer Vitruvius didn't consider the Tuscan to be a formal order. Tuscan temples were the products of the Etruscans, the early inhabitants of Tuscany. Their buildings were wood, and none survived by Vitruvius's time, so their works did not make it in the architectural canon. However, Renaissance architects such as Palladio, Vignola, and Serlio in essence invented a Tuscan order for masonry works. They based their versions on Vitruvius's descriptions and applied rules to it, thus adding the order to the canon. For example, we see Giacomo Vignola's invention of a Tuscan order. Well, what appears to be a standard Tuscan entablature and capital for the lawns colonnades is actually an amalgam of options offered by Palladio in Book I. First, its cornice is based on that shown in Plate 12, Book 1 of Palladio's treatise. But Jefferson substituted its plain architrave and rustic frieze with the architrave and plain frieze shown on the right. His combining that architrave and frieze with the cornice gives you the lawn's Tuscan entablature. Furthermore, Jefferson avoided the fancy Tuscan capital shown in Plate 12, instead using the simpler capital in Plate 11. 
This has a plain abacus and a simple overlow for the echinus, and we find it comfortably applied to the lawn's columns. And an interesting detail of Palladio's cornice, shown in plate 12, is the concave undercut of the soffit behind the fascia. This is a defining feature of Jefferson's Tuscan cornices. We now come to the rotunda, the focal point and climax of Jefferson's academical village design. Jefferson's original scheme for the university oddly had no such dominant structure. The idea of a monumental domed edifice actually came from Latrobe in the form of a tiny sketch on a letter responding to Jefferson's request for a critique of his concept. Well, Jefferson immediately grasped the suggestion and began planning such a structure. His inspiration was the Pantheon, the most celebrated of all ancient Roman works, a building that Jefferson knew well from Leone's copper plate engraving. Jefferson considered the Pantheon to be the most perfect example of what he called spherical architecture, where the building's diameter and height are the same, thus achieving a spherical volume. Jefferson applied such a proportional system to his rotunda design, which he specified to have half the dimensions of the Pantheon, making it approximately 77 feet in diameter and in height. To accommodate its smaller scale, he fronted the rotunda with a hexastyle rather than an octastyle portico, as on the Pantheon. The rotunda was the university's signature building. It housed the library, defining it as a temple of learning. Regrettably, the rotunda burned in 1895, leaving it a gutted shell. The portico's columns and capitals were structurally damaged by the fire's intense heat and had to be dismantled. The rotunda was rebuilt within its walls by architect Stanford White with some exterior modifications, and White's interior scheme for the rotunda was a complete departure from Jefferson's. He made one big room of most of the space. Well, before we further consider the rotunda's post-fire history, I want to discuss the orders that Jefferson originally specified for its exterior. Fortunately, we have a pre-fire photograph that clearly shows the order's original detailing. As noted, the Rotunda's Corinthian capitals were also ordered from Carrara. Jefferson directed that they were, quote, to be copied exactly as those of the Pantheon, as represented by Palladio, Book 4, Chapter 20, Plate 60. That, of course, would be the Leone edition. But with his ever-present inclination to mix and match, Jefferson chose not to have the rotunda's main entablature based on the pantheons. Rather, it was to follow the entablature shown on plate 26 in book one of Palladio's treatise. Jefferson wrote that he had, quote, examined all the ancient Corinthian in my possession and observed that Palladio as usual, has given the finest of them all the happiest combination." Unquote. Now that meant Palladio's Corinthian in Book One. So we have capitals based on the Pantheon's Corinthian, a specific ancient example, combined with a modern Corinthian entablature as devised by Palladio. And actually, there's little difference between the two. Mainly, the Pantheon entablature has no dental molding. Palladio's generic Corinthian entablature has dentals. So we got dentals on the rotunda. Well, the rotunda's Carrara marble capitals were crisp and beautiful and showed nowhere until fire damage made them unusable. Stanford White's replacement capitals were made of inferior marble, so in barely a hundred years they had eroded beyond repair. For the rotunda's recent and third restoration, completed in 2017, it was decided to follow Jefferson's precedent and have new capitals again carved in Carrara. While the Carrara artisans continue to be as skilled as ever, it still can be done, and the carvers were enthralled at being engaged to do it. Well, we see the new capitals in place, 
And as for Stanford White's exterior entablature, because it more or less followed the rotunda's original entablature, it was retained. And it's made of stamped copper rather than wood, so it should last indefinitely. So even despite its various vicissitudes, the rotunda's exterior continues to maintain its architectural integrity and be a commanding presence, as Jefferson intended. Well, we can't stop here because the rotunda's interior is an important part of the story. Jefferson divided the rotunda into two main levels. One entered from the portico into an hourglass-shaped hall, off of which were three oval rooms used for lectures. The doubled stair led to the library, the prodigious domed space on the upper level. Encircling the dome room was a colonnade of forty paired columns in the composite order. So this completed Jefferson's program for providing specimens of the classical orders for the architectural lectures. The academical village could thus boast examples of all five orders of the classical canon, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composite. For the composite order, Jefferson, of course, turned to his Leone edition of Palladio's treatise. Like Pavilion 9's Ionic capitals, the Rotunda's 40 composite capitals were made of wood, also carved by Philip Sturdivant of Richmond. Well, sadly, all of the interior was lost in the 1895 fire. So, fast forward to the 1970s. The Rotunda's second restoration in the 1970s was an attempt to return the building to Jefferson's design as much as possible. Stanford White's interior was removed and Jefferson's two-level configuration was restored. The dome room with its 40 composite capitals was replicated. But the 1970s capitals were made of molded composition material and lacked the crisp detailing of the originals. Moreover, they were based on the wrong edition of Palladio's treatise, which resulted in their being slightly too large for their shafts, and you can see the abacus of each jammed together. In the Rotunda's most recent restoration, the 1970s capitals were replaced with carved wooden ones of the proper dimension and using the proper depiction of the composite order for this singular space. Like the originals, these were also produced in Richmond. We see a pair of the new capitals shortly after they were installed. Well, we now have the re-restored dome room echoing much of the stately character of Jefferson's original. And where the 1970s dome room was used only sporadically, mainly for special functions, the dome room today is freely and regularly employed by the students as a place of study as Jefferson intended. Well, this brings us to the end of our examination of the university's classical orders. The Jefferson Complex at the University of Virginia is a World Heritage Site. Its areas of significance to world culture are multiple. But we must not forget that a key intended function of the design yet endures, and that is, in its founder's words, providing models of taste and good architecture, of a variety of appearance, no two alike, so as to serve as specimens for the architectural lectures. And if you've never done so, I hope you will someday visit this unique place.